I'm so impressed. And my brain is full. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very honored to be here today. I'm Kelly Close. Uh, I'm from North Carolina. I work with the Division of Public Health in the oral health section as the early childhood oral health coordinator. And I want to just thank Dr. Atchison, Dr. Weintraub, and Dr. Rozier for highlighting Into the Mouths of Babes as a case study in their commission paper, um, which is how I got to be here today. So um, I uh, will get started here. All right, I'm pushing the red button. No, the green button. <laughs> the big green button. Okay. So when, um, when I was invited today, I was asked uh, to describe Into the Mouths of Babes, recount our 20-year evolution, explain our evaluation and outcomes, define examples of oral health literacy in IMB, and finish in 20 minutes. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to jump in and uh, do my best on that and be grateful that we have a chance for questions um, coming up at the end. So when Into the Mouths of Babes, which we affectionately refer to as IMB, uh, began, our original goals were to increase access for preventive oral health services for low-income children ages 0 to 3, reduce the prevalence of early childhood caries, and then reduce the burden of treatment needs within, for our inadequate um, and stretched dental workforce in North Carolina. So North Carolina had identified an early childhood caries crisis and had already done a small pilot in the western part of the state from 1998 to 2000. Uh, and this, because it was successful, was expanded in 2001 and became into the mouths of babes. So once it went statewide, these were the original partners. And these six organizations and agencies collaborated for success, each one taking a very active role. And by active, I mean they were invested. For example, the medical organizations, the Family Physicians and Pediatric Society, were the ones that negoti negotiated the reimbursement rates with Medicaid. The oral health section and the School of Dentistry worked together to develop the training for the physicians, and then the School of Public Health worked to develop the evaluation for the program. So every one of these organizations had a very important role. The first five years of the project was funded by grants, and I have to thank HRSA and CDC for that, because at that time, uh, they hired me to coordinate, and uh, it paid my salary. So um, I also have to say that, um, you know, I appreciate what Dr. Inge had shared this morning um, about reimbursement, um, because it is important to reimburse providers, whether medical or dental, for their time, effort, and what they're doing to provide care um, in their daily work. So also today, I heard uh, physicians sharing about their limited resources in time in offering and providing oral health care to patients. And this comes up quite a bit in North Carolina. Um, it, it, over time, it's even it's increased. And uh, in North Carolina, um, this issue is it's really not an issue of the dentist being able to even take over that responsibility if they wanted to. Parents just do not take their children to the dentist um, at age one, and even age two, as they do more than they used to. But this was something that this original partnership realized, was that they needed to offer this service where children were, and that was in the primary care office where children we're going to get immunizations. And so that worked out to be family physicians, pediatricians, 
and local health departments. So that is where these services are offered. So for the preventive oral health services, it does include more than just fluoride varnish. It includes an oral evaluation, risk assessment, the varnish application, parent counseling, and then a dental referral, preferably at age one if the dental workforce is adequate. And if not, then we've developed a priority oral health risk assessment and referral tool uh, that is optional for the provider to use to refer children based on their risk. So physicians, what we found out in our, some of our research is that physicians, uh, particularly pediatricians, do view dentists overall as specialists. I do believe that they're trained to treat whatever they can in their office, and then when they can't treat something, refer it. And so when children have high-risk behavior, behaviors for caries, like diet types of behaviors and habits, um, they counsel parents and feel like they should be able to do that and have a change, rather than referring to a, to a dentist based on just risk factors. Of course, they're great about referring if there's disease present, and we know that. But I do think there would need to be a mind shift in how they view dentists as a general provider and practitioner, as we have talked about earlier today. Um, I know that dentistry sees themselves, at least general dentistry, as primary care. But I can't say that that's true across the board for medicine, seeing dentistry as primary care. So that's my opinion, and that is based on surveys we've done in North Carolina. So I just speak for our state. So when, when North Carolina Medicaid reimburses for these preventive oral health services, which now is approximately $50 when this service is done, two codes are billed, they're D codes, and they are billed together on the same date of service. The D0145 code, if you're familiar with that, is oral evaluation for patients under three, even though our program does reimburse for this to be done up to age three and a half. And then the D1206 is for fluoride varnish. A provider can do this a maximum of six times this procedure for a child from tooth eruption to age three and a half. There must be a minimum of a 60-day time interval. And that was decided because sometimes early in the well-child visit schedule, the visits are 90 days apart or less, and this was so as not to interfere with that well-child visit schedule. For example, here is a suggested uh, schedule from Medicaid, just how they could time those visits if they want to do them with a well-child visit, which they don't have to do. They can also be done at a sick visit or as a separate visit. So to give you kind of an overall view, um, this is just the kind of the growth in the number of services provided from 2000 to 2017. And it um, is not individual children, but it is the number of visits. So we have a growth, you know, quite a bit. Um, we're up pushing 180,000 um, in a year. So we do quite a, quite a few of these in North Carolina. Um, another way to look at it, another view, is as a percentage. So in 2016, 57.8% uh, of the average 47,000 quarterly well child visits for one and two year olds included preventive oral health services. So we do have room for improvement, quite a bit of improvement. And of course, we don't work in a vacuum either. So over this time period, we've had other community programs that we have reached out to and worked with. In early Head Start programs, 
one of our studies had parents report that 80% of young children received a preventive oral health service by a dentist or medical provider by age three. So this, in this study, study we interviewed parents in, of Head Start, early Head Start children and then a control group of parents of children on Medicaid in that community. So we found in those communities there was a higher rate of children having preventive oral health services. And just before I talk about the next outcomes, I just wanted to say we can't separate our services out as we do our studies for outcomes. So we can't say, you know, it's the fluoride varnish that is the good part of it. We include the parent counseling and, and the whole bundle of services. I do want to recognize Dr. Ashley Krantz today. She's here in the audience and she has done quite a bit of uh, work with our program. She worked with Dr. Rozier at UNC uh, Gilling School of Public Health. Where's Dr. Krantz? There she is over there. I'm so glad she's here today. Um, and now she's at RAND and continuing to do research on a national level about um, preventive oral health services. So I'm very grateful to her for her work. So here are three studies, and I wanted to, for you to have the information with the links in case you wanted to read them. But these are just a few of about 50 studies that we have on outcomes from our program. We know that setting and provider type does not influence um, the effectiveness of the preventive oral health services that physicians and dentists um, are, are both effective in doing these services for children in North Carolina, and that children receiving four or more of the IMB visits before age three show a 17.7 reduction in tooth decay. And then we did have a, a study that showed oral health improvement on a population level in kindergartners in North Carolina, um, showing that it reduced the gap in tooth decay between children from low and other income families at the community level. So um, just we have a great group there at the Gilling School of Public Health led by Dr. Rozier that has worked hard on uh, our research and outcomes. This has already been mentioned today, the um, 2014 U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation. And fluoride varnish has been recommended for all children from tooth eruption through age five um, to be done by their primary care physician. And I thought the interesting thing about this was that last bullet, evidence is insufficient for recommending routine screening exams for dental caries. And just pointing out that we just need more research. We need more research because in, in 2004, that bullet was fluoride varnish. It said there's insufficient evidence for fluoride varnish. So um, you researchers, we need you to do some research on screening. <laughs> so let's talk about parents for a minute. We do have some uh, studies with parents. And parents do express satisfaction with having this kind of service at their medical office which I think is really cool. And we know too that there are low health literacy demands on parents during the counseling sessions. And we know this from uh, a study that recorded these sessions and then had interviews with parents about recall of what they heard from their provider. Um, and, and we also know that parents are more likely to take their child for a dental visit when their healthcare provider makes that recommendation. So I think this you know, just shows us we really need both. We need medical and dental providers with that message to parents about oral health and taking care of their child's teeth. Parents play such a, a huge role and I feel like they're overlooked. I, I know it's hard to do research with parents, but I feel like a lot because especially that whole thing about, um, you know, not 
just not knowing their barriers. I know their barriers for parents, and we don't talk about those. We talk about access a lot, and we don't talk about, you know, why parents don't go. We, we kind of make assumptions, and I think that those might not be right. So motivational interviewing is a communication technique that you all probably know about, your health literacy. I see everybody shaking their heads. Um, I think what I love about it is it's evidence-based, and we know that it is associated with improvements in pediatric health behaviors and outcomes. In North Carolina, medical providers do have opportunities to, to have training in this, and so in our upcoming uh, Into the Mouths of Babes e-learning module that we will be releasing uh, in the next few months, we're going to have some examples of parent counseling using this technique. So I'm really pleased about that and looking forward to, to having that um, as part of um, information for physicians. Community integration, I already mentioned Early Head Start. We've worked with Early Head Start, not doing fluoride varnish, but making sure they have information for parents about having fluoride varnish done at the medical home. And we've expanded that some now to fluoride toothpaste because fluoride toothpaste is, uh, you know, along with fluoride varnish, one of the top ways to prevent early childhood caries. And we really have to, I think, look at all the ways we can prevent early childhood caries. So this would include, you know, WIC, home visitors, child care, all the, all, the, all the avenues um, that we have. It does take the entire community. And I heard, you know, Dr. Taylor talk today about the integration of evidence-based messaging. And plain language um, is, is important in that. Consistency and collaboration, because I know that even the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry have differing recommendations about fluoride varnish. Um, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommends it for high-risk kids. You know, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends it for all children. So that, that's conflicting. Um, I know that everybody agrees on fluoride toothpaste. And these amounts, just in case you don't know, that smear up at the top of the screen is for children from tooth eruption to age three. That pea size drop on the lower picture is from age three to age six. And this is just an underutilized effective tool for preventing tooth decay. So I have to put that plug in. We're working on fluoride toothpaste guidelines for childcare in North Carolina. So. Um, I'm getting the sign there that I've got to hurry up, so I guess I'm digressing from my, my message. Um, so toothtalk.org, <laughs> toothtalk.org is a website for early childhood caregivers, parents, health care providers, anyone interested in colorful, short, informative videos, articles, and other evidence-based information. It's sponsored by a grant we have from the Duke Endowment, it's the North Carolina Oral Health Section, and the UNC Gillings School of Public Health. And I would encourage you to take a look at it, pass it on, send it out to your colleagues. We even have a web app with fluoride toothpaste information and pictures like the ones I showed you so that your colleagues who work in medicine and dentistry can just pull up their phone app show the picture of fluoride toothpaste to their patients and say, hey, this is how much fluoride toothpaste you should use for your child. So anyway, I've got 30 seconds. And um, I just want to thank you for having the opportunity to talk to you about early childhood oral health and fluoride varnish. Because, you know, prevention, prevention is much cheaper and, and much healthier than treatment. And somebody else said that today. I think it was Dr. Inch again. And... 
once a child has a, has a cavity in a baby tooth, it's much more likely they're going to have them in their permanent teeth. And, you know, as we're talking about adults with all these other problems, it's so expensive and much more difficult to, to fix those. So there's a, there's a lot to be said for starting early with prevention and with children's parents. So thank you for having me today, and uh, I look forward to your questions.